Scott, he played hard ball, big league baseball, did anything to get on, put the bat on the ball for a single to left field. Hard! Sandberg over his head, right center field, base hit! One run will score! Ball on his ball, getting it! Here comes Wiggins! the Robinson Gearing Studio Complex and straight out of God's country, Polly's Island, South Carolina, the Let's Talk Baseball Podcast Network proudly presents Backwards K Pod. And now, here's the host of the show, Jake Robinson. Good moment, you baseball universe. What's cracking? Once again, back is the incredible, the pod animal. Jake the Snake Robinson from the Let's Talk Baseball Podcast Network. I'm coming out of Paulie's Island, South Kagalagi. Back in the Captain Kirk chair. Shields down. Photons up. Prepare to engage on this week's digital audio program that I call Backwards K-Pop. Where we collect ball players and their stories. Want to welcome my always expanding Seamhead Harmy back into the fold. What's good, y'all? And look, all of you newbies around the world falling into our little baseball rabbit hole here. Brace yourself and enjoy the ride as we literally live our lives at Backwards K Pod virtually, uh, you know, and vicariously through baseball and her rich history of indelible moments told through her stories. Backwards K Pod. It's available on all platforms, wherever you listen to your pods, or you can visit my website, diamondsnakejake.podbean.com, to hear this or any of the other shows in my vault of archives. And I will never charge you, my awesome audience, a penny for the content here. I'm never going to Patreon you or crowdsource you, as the kids like to call it. In this horrible economy, peanut butter costs almost nine bucks now, folks. Peanut butter. You kidding me? It's outrageous. I'm going to charge you for the podcast content when peanut butter costs nine bucks. Whatever, man. I'll never do that to my audience. I have some merch coming in the second season and other streams I'll be working working on. But I promise you, I will never charge you for the content of this show. I'm just going to come through every Tuesday with that free baseball smoke. You don't want that smoke. And hopefully, I won't lobotomize too many brains in here when I'm doling out the skinny. All I need you to do, my mighty C-Meds, is listen, download, share. And if you're an Apple or a Spotify user or any of these other platforms that offer you a chance to rate and review me, please do so as you see fit. I ain't scared. Those few little things keep me and the brand viable. And they pay for the bills. You know, think of me as like a waiter delivering you delicious meats and cheeses to eat. 
Leave it sip, you rat bastard. Heard? Okay. And look, maybe lobotomies as a result of my info, it ain't such a bad thing, I'm thinking now. I mean, how cool would it be to get an email from someone saying, dude, I just heard your show on Des- Disco Demolition, and literally my skull imploded. And good job, Snake. Keep it up, bro. <laughs> I'm thinking now, that may be, you know, the biggest compliment a podcaster could ever hear, you know, receive, right? You know, uh, your brain was, your, your skinny was so good that it lobotomized my brain. So, look, I want to make sure if that ever happens, you have a way of letting me know. You can always email the show, backwardskpod at gmail.com. The show's Twitter handle is at back underscore K underscore podcast. And you can always find me on the Facebook and YouTube pages under the Let's Talk Baseball Podcast Network banner. And with the 2022 MLB playoffs underway, this historic season that we've witnessed is winding down. I just want to say good luck to all your teams for those that are still in it to win it. We've now seen the Guardians, the Mariners, and the uh, Phillies move on to the next round. And with the Pods and the Mets prepared to play the season clincher as I'm recording this. And many of your teams may not be playing in the postseason, like myself. But the games have been amazing. And I, and I personally have enjoyed all these series. But still, have no fear. Regardless if you're in it or not, the season never ends here at Backwards K-Pod. We are a 24-7, 365 days a year Baseball, baseball, baseball. So, for all you freaks out there like me, I understand I lose a couple of you, to, a couple of you for a couple months to American football. But when you come back, that vault of archives will be completely stocked with stories. I, I also understand there are a lot of fans like me who hate the off season, who sit around looking for any news on baseball. Well, I ain't going anywhere. I'm going to be here. The WBC is on the horizon. We'll still tell stories here. But I'll keep you guys abreast on some of the big and innocuous all-season stories as well. So, nothing changes here at Backwards K Pod. I'll be here every single week of the dull all-season to keep your whip sharp. And, folks, I got a lot of great response for last week's Josh Gibson show. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent me messages. I really, I enjoyed reading all of them this week. And I got a couple I'd like to share. I got one here from Johnny out of Eastern Kentucky. He says, the Memphis Red Sox, a black team, who one of the few to flat out own their own ballpark, once gave Josh Gibson a tryout, but manager Candy Jim Taylor was unimpressed and said he would never make the grade as a catcher. Can you imagine how different the story of several franchises would have been had they kept him. And he also mentioned that as a person who lives here in Pauly's Island, South Kagalagi, there's an old Negro League park in Charleston on the corner of Grove and Rutledge that has tons of unspoken history inside of it. And man, I love responses like that. He said he was listening to, he said he was listening to the show with his son, and folks, for me, that's what it's all about. I love when the fans break me off a little something that I didn't know. First of all, I'd never even heard of Katie Jim Taylor. And I went down that vortex for about an hour and a half. And all I can say is that brother <laughs> missed the boat. And I've mentioned it many times, that butterfly effect moment. No doubt history would have been forever changed had Josh ended up in Memphis and not Pittsburgh. And I want to thank you for being in my uh, Seaman Army here, Johnny, out of Eastern Kentucky. And thank you for the line. And I've been kind of going back and forth with this guy all week, and he, he really knows his baseball. I mean, all these high IQ baseball fans that I have around me. I love it. It's amazing. Bob out of Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Love the show. And left me all kinds of questions. I mean, a whole litany of them, right? One of them went like this. Cool Papa Bell once said Josh's snap throw to second was so light 
You almost didn't need a glove to catch it. In contrast, Bell said that Campanella always threw a heavy ball. Any idea how Josh would have been able to do that? That's a great question, Bob. So, like I said last week, we have to preface all things Negro Leagues with the credibility of others. You know, those special people who, you know, the Buck O'Neills, the uh, Bob Kendrick, who will never let these supernovas die. So, my first explanation would be this. Each new generation that comes up in the game, in theory, they get a little stronger, they get a little bit faster. They improve diet, training, and mechanics. So, that would be my first thought, since J.P. was a little bit younger than Josh. Also, I went back and looked at some of these pictures of Josh. I mean, because that's all you can base on. None of us here saw him play. So I went back and I looked at some pictures of Josh throwing a ball. And by all means, get on your Google machine and do the research yourself. But it may be just me, but in many of these picks, Josh has like an almost change-up palm ball grip on the ball. While Campy has, a, you know, the more traditional forcing grip on his throws. Again, this may coincide with youngsters always getting the heads up on new training and mechanics. But it stands to reason for me that the four-seam grip is going to generate more zip, more pop than that palm ball grip. And if these are snap throws we're talking about, it may have been quicker for Josh to employ this grip on those type of plays. Uh, you know, I really can't give you a definitive answer. But that's my theory. Man, I'm sticking to it. Also, I'd imagine that I really couldn't find uh, much on Josh's siblings last week. And my dude, Corey Love, down in Florida, he sent me a link to a uh, Nancy Gibson Mahaffey obituary. And... She was the sister of Josh Gibson. She apparently died September 17, 2009 on the north side of Pittsburgh. And man, she lived a life. I'm almost tempted to track down his great-grandson, Sean. And if anyone in the audience knows him, I'm fascinated by all things Josh. I think I'd like to interview that dude. And that's really great stuff. I I love getting your messages, guys. Once again, I want to thank all of you for your messages. I'm truly blessed to be surrounded by so many brilliant and passionate baseball minds. And I love interacting with you guys. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Okay, so with all that being said, I see that Catcher is ready to come down. Let's get this runaway train loaded down and ready to roll. It's time to go in. On this week's topic, one of the true ambassadors of the great game of baseball, there has never really been a sports icon of his stature that is linked to a city. Quite like Tony Gwynn. I mean, sure, baseball has had their share of Cowerkin Juniors, George Brents, Joe Mowers, among others, to, to have these legendary playing careers for their city, but nothing quite like Tony. The eight-time batting champ went to college at San Diego State, spent his entire Hall of Fame career with the Padres, and then returned to his alma mater to become a collegiate baseball coach for 12 seasons. His link to San Diego has made him a larger-than-life icon to that city. And that's a testament to his quiet personality, balanced play on the field, and giving San Diego a true homegrown legend, an identity. Someone who was ingrained in the community. Anthony Keith Gwynn was born on May 9th, 1960 in Los Angeles, California. He was a son of Charles and Vendela Gwynn. His father, Charles, was a warehouse manager and his mother, Vendela, uh, was a postal worker. And Tony was the middle sibling of three boys. His older brother, Charles, and his younger brother, Chris. And the family moved to Long Beach when he was nine. The three baseball crazy boys would grab figs off the tree in the yard 
and play baseball games with them so as not to break any windows. Or they would resort to making baseballs out of socks. And that just so takes me back to my youth uh, when we would literally make balls with Dixie cups, rubber bands, and tape. I mean, the things you will do as a kid to play baseball around houses, right? I'm curious, what did you guys used to play baseball uh, around these residential housing. What, what were some of your uh, MacGyver-like techniques there? But I digress. The Gwyns were Dodgers fans. And Tony's favorite player was Willie Davis. However, when the boys played in the backyard, Tony and Chris would always be the Cardinals versus the Pirates. And you may ask yourself why. But Tony would explain years later that the Cards and the Bucks, well, they had all the left-handed hitters. But Tony would also say baseball was kind of just something that we did to pass the time in the spring and the summer. I even told my mom I didn't think I would play baseball in college. Well, she and my dad told me it might be something I could fall back on. Tony graduated from Long Beach Poly High School before attending San Diego State in 1977. He was an absolute athletic beast, becoming a multi-sport star. He joined the Aztecs basketball team. He played point guard, and he was an all-conference player, twice in the Western Athletic Conference, and is still the only athlete in WAC history to earn all-conference honors in multiple sports. He still holds school records for assists in a game with 18 Assist in a season, 221, and assist in a career, 590. He is arguably, probably not even arguably, he's probably, he is the greatest point guard in Aztecs history. Amazingly, Gwynn didn't play baseball until his sophomore year, and he made an immediate impact once he did play. In his three seasons of playing baseball for San Diego State, he was an All-American twice, both times leading the team in batting. And in his junior season, he batted 423 with six home runs and 29 RBI. As a senior, he was even better. He smashed 11 home runs. He drove in 62. And he compiled a 416 average. And, you know, this is before Dion, Bo, Kyler Murray. You know, right around, you know, it's just Tony Gwynn and Dave Winfield, really. These two, you know, sport athlete monsters. So, there's Tony Gwynn. He's balancing two sports. And he has this ability to switch gears when he needs to. For example, on March 7th, 1981, he finished off his basketball season with 16 points, 16 assists effort against the Aggies of New Mexico. And two days later, he is dominating a twin bill baseball game versus USC. In the doubleheader, Gwynn went... Three for seven with a double, three runs, five ribs, as well as a stolen stolen base. He also recorded the game-winning RBI in both of those contests. Gwynn's success, as well as popularity in the San Diego metropolitan area, it promo- you know prompted both the San Diego Padres to draft him in the third round. And the San Diego Clippers selected Tony in the 10th round of the NBA draft. Now, Tony had met his wife in elementary school. Her name's Alicia. The two dated in high school. They attended San Diego State together. Alicia was a member of the track and field team. And the couple would get married after the draft as Tony decided baseball with the Padres was his journey. And how ironic is that, right? He he doesn't even think he's going to play for the college team. His parents say, well, it could be something good on the backup. He could have went either way on here, and he decides to go baseball. And oosh. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank God for that, right? Butterfly effect moment again, where things in history are changed by the flapping of a butterfly wing or something like that. I don't know. But imagine a baseball universe without Tony Gwynn. Just imagine that. I look at Tony personally as like this Ted Williams of my generation. Like Teddy, whenever I hear Tony talk hitting, I I shut my lips, I cock my head like a dog, and I listen to those informative, beautiful words coming out of his mouth. 
I just can't imagine not hearing him talk hitting. And I certainly cannot imagine a baseball universe without him. But again, I digress. In 1981, he immediately reported to Walla Walla, Washington of the Northwest League. The first year rookie uh, baller, he batted 311 to earn league MVP honors before getting the call up to Double A. He spent the final three weeks of the season at Double A Amarillo, Texas, where he hit 462 over 23 games. And in 1982, he begins the season with the Triple A Hawaiian Islanders of the Pat Coast League, and. There he's you know he's just continuing to hit. He's got a three twenty eight average in ninety three games, and the Padres had seen enough. They gave him the call to the big leagues, and his major league baseball road was beginning to be paved. On July ninth, I'm sorry, nineteenth, on July nineteenth, nineteen eighty two, Tony made his MLB debut versus the Phillies, going two for four with an RBI in fifty four games and. 209 plate appearances, he batted 289. That rookie season would be the only year he did not crack 300 as a part-time player. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a little sidetracked by my dog. She's dreaming here. And you see, you hear it like she's dreaming about Tony Gwynn. She's chasing all those line drops. But I'm going to roll with it because that's my girl. All right, so let's, let's better explain this. Uh, 54 games, 209 plate appearances, he batted 289. Uh, that rookie season would be the only year he did not crack 300. As a part time player in 1983, he batted 309 in 86 games. It sounds like she's starting to chill out. In 1984, Gwen cracks the starting lineup, never looks back, pretty much changing the trajectory of his career as well as those of the team. He made his first of his uh, 15 NL All-Star appearances in 1984. And he would go on to win the first of his eight batting titles with a 351 batting average. He also showcased his speed. And a young Tony Gwynn could run like the wind. He swiped 33 bags and he led the NL in hits with 211. But even more importantly... He led the San Diego Padres to their first postseason appearance in franchise history. And Meatball Tommy Lasorda once asked, How do you defend a hitter that hits the ball hard down the left field line, hard down the right field line, and hard up the middle? How do you defend that? Anyone? Anyone? That same year, Al Oliver, quite an accomplished hitter himself, He said, I'm not in awe of too many people, but this Gwynn kid is the best young hitter I've ever seen in my life. I can honestly say I would pay to watch that kid hit. In the 1984 NLCS, the Padres faced the Chicago Cubs, and Gwynn continued to hit, batting 368, scoring six runs, and driving in three as the Friars erased a two games to zero deficit to win the final three games of the five game series. And that would continue the whole Billy Goat curse for the Cubs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Fruitless pursuit of a title in those days. Definitely one of the better NLGSs ever. If, if, if you buy a YouTube machine, I would watch Game 5 of that series, like like Pronto. It is an instant classic. And you heard the clip in the beginning, uh, Tony Gwynn, I mean, he hit a laser that just ate up Ryan Sandberg at uh, second base and broke the game open, and the Padres would go on to win that game. Unfortunately for the Fathers, despite that thrilling series victory over the Cubs, they ran and went into the real baseball juggernauts of all time. I'm talking the 1984 Detroit Tigers, one of the most under, you know, valued teams that I can think of. The Padres were no match for them. Not many teams in baseball that year would have been. They, they, or any year, honestly. They, they are, without a doubt, one of the most fierce baseball teams in my lifetime. The Tigers came out the gate with a 35-5 and record to start the season, and they literally curb-stomped 
everyone in their path that year, including the Padres, whom they dispatched in five games in the 1984 World Series. Gwynn batted a mortal 263 in that series against uh, the likes of Jack Morris, Dan Petrie, Milt Wilcox, and that devastating back end of that Tigers bully. He had five hits and a run scored. I'm pretty sure that uh, that 1984 Tigers team is going to be featured next season here at Backwards K Pod, where we collect ball players and their stories. The Padres right fielder followed up his stellar 1984 season with even more magnificent play in 85. Tony gathered a league leading 211 hits. He scored 107 runs, batted 329. And he put the National League on notice that this is the way the rest of the eight is going to be, you son of a mothers. In 1986, he proves his all-round greatness by earning his first gold glove in his story career. He then takes his game to even greater heights. Um... In 87, when he bashes out 218 hits for a 370 average to win his second batting title. He also scores 119 runs and he steals a career high 56 stolen bases. It is the first of three consecutive batting titles for Tony. So in 88, he wins another batting title with a 313 average and he would collect his number one, uh, hit number 1,000 off of Nolan Ryan on April 22nd in Houston. And in 1989, he sets the NL pace with with a 336 mark and 203 hits. And I got a lot of things going on here. Uh, I do believe I have audio of that thousand. Hey, let's see what we got here. Let's see. Gets Nolan Ryan. One pitch sounded hot. One one delivery. A loop in the left center field. Coming on fast to center field. Can he get it? No, it dropped. Boy, Quinn just laid one in there in front of Gerald Young and Billy Hatcher. The shortstop is going out. Nobody got to it. Win gets rolling with a base hit. Well, uh, Gerald Young took two steps back on that, and that's really not studying the hitter very well. Here's Alomar, and he's getting quite a hand, and that's 1,000 hits for Tony Gwynn. And by this time, he is widely regarded as the best natural hitter of the game, as well as one of the best to ever do it. I mean, he's literally on that trajectory. While Gwynn was talented for sure, he is also like this meticulous a uh, hard worker. He works hard at his craft. You can, you can always find Tony first in the cage early in the morning, or you see him there hitting off a tee. He's always looking to sharpen his hand-eye coordination. But what separated Gwent was the way he lived, breathed, and studied baseball. He was one of the first to use the tech of the 80s and accumulate like all these VHS tapes. He would take his VCR and his tapes on the road. He would tape the games. Uh, On one, he would tape the games. And on the other one, he would tape only his at-bats. And then after the game, he would study those tapes. He was also like a king of smashing the ball hard the other way. I mean, just as hard as if he pulled it. Atlanta Braves pitcher, all-time great Greg Maddox, will tell you that he detested facing Gwen more than any other hitter, proclaiming everything Tony hit off of me was hard. Whether it was line drives, grounders, pulled or sprayed, everything is hard hit. He never rolls over weak grounders. And Tony's response was, one of the reasons I get many hits the other way is because it's hard to read the ball off of my bat. My hands come through the zone first, the barrel trails it, and it kind of hides the ball from the fielder until it's been hit by the bat. And two things for, for me real quick right here. First of all, I said it earlier, whenever Tony talked hitting, it's, it's a lot like listening to Teddy Ballgame talk hitting. And as a youngster who loves baseball, You couldn't be better served by being quiet and listening whenever Mr. Williams and Mr. Gwynn talk batting. In fact, my young Seamheads, I highly suggest you go to YouTube, study these two, if you wish to excel in your field. And number two, 
I kind of know what Tony is talking about here. As a former third baseman myself, you have those left-hand batters that have such quick hands through the box that your brain and your eyes, they have like this instantaneous mirage, and you naturally zero in on those hands. And before you know it, that bail, that bat trails through while you're still caught up in the quick hand mirage. And if you, and if you, you just naturally have hands like that, then your eyes are pretty beast too. Enough to cut that egg in half and shoot it the other way. I've personally seen guys do this to me down at third base. And it can be a little intimidating. Most left-handed hitters, they don't have opposite crown ball power. Unless you have those quick-ass hands. After three batting titles in a row, Gwynn didn't win another one for another four years. He's still at 324 with an OPS of 124 from 1990 to 1993. On August 6, 1993, he collects base hit number 2000 at Jack Murphy Stadium off of Bruce Ruffin of the Colorado Rockies. Play. And there it is. He said he was going to do it, and he does. just like you're supposed to. I'm so glad the shift is going on, but that's another story for another podcast. In 1994, in the midst of Gwyn's best season yet, a labor strike by the Players Union ended what could have been a historical season. Tony had been flirting with 400 that season, trying to become the first player since Ted Williams to bat 400 in 53 years. When the strike popped off, he was batting 394 with a league leading 165 hits in only 110 games. Having missed his shot, Gwyn, of course, was disappointed, saying, I'd be lying if I didn't say I wanted to take a crack at batting 400. When the dust cleared in 1995 and the Players Union and their owners, they made nice. Tony returned to the business of smashing out base hits, and he resumed his monopoly on batting titles for the next four years. After falling short of his goals because of circumstances beyond his control due to the strike, Gwynn dominated the National League from 1995 to 1997, batting 368, 353, 372 during that span. In 1996, the Padres get back to the postseason, but they lose to the Cards in a three-game series. Gwynn, he had a fantastic series with a 308, 365, 692 slash, but it just wasn't San Diego's year. Two years later, 1998, the baseball gods smiled down on Tony and the Friars as the team and Gwynn 
have a season for the ages. Tony finishes the year with a 321, 364, 501 slash, and an OPS plus of 133, leading his beloved pods to the NOS title and a spot in the postseason for the third time in franchise history. The Padres beat the Astros down in four games in the NLDS, and then they shocked the mighty and heavily favored Atlanta Braves in six games to win the NL pennant and give Gwynn his second shot at a World Series championship. But alas, again, the Pods, they draw a juggernaut of a World Series opponent here. The 1998 New York Yankees, one of the greatest baseball teams ever, right? Certainly one of the best of my lifetime, without question. And the Yankees were at this point in the midst of constructing a 13-year stretch of straight playoff appearances that would culminate in four World Series titles. And the Yankees had very little problem uh, dispatching the outmanned and outgunned Padres in a four-game sweep. Despite the sweep, the Yankees, uh, they did have a problem containing Gwynn. The crafty vet, he batted 500 for the series with eight hits and 16 at-bats. He hit the only home run in his postseason career, drove in three, scored twice. For many fans who missed Gwen 14 years earlier on the big stage, this was a chance for the new generation of CMNs to witness the brilliance and incredible abilities of a mostly unsung baseball icon and a future Hall of Famer. Gwynn's World Series appearance during that 98 season was actually, it was kind of like a goodbye from the national, the national stage. He would never play a full season again. He played in 111 games in 1999, and he would get his 3,000th hit on August 6th at Montreal. A single in the right center field off of Dan Smith. The first base umpire, Kerwin Daly. He was, ironically, one of Gwynn's college teammates all those years ago for the STU uh, Aztecs. And he was able to share that special moment with his dear friend. Smith is ready. Gwynn waiting to pitch. There's a drive. Right center field. Base hit. And there it is. The whole doctor. You can hang a star on that, baby. A star for the ages for Tony Gwynn. Number 3,000. Well, the entire Padre ball club is heading to first base to congratulate Tony. The entire team is out there. And a very wise Reggie Sanders goes over and retrieves the ball from Mike Mordecai to give to Tony Gwynn. Number 3,000. Incredible. And a little side note here. He, he did kind of make one more appearance on the national stage. And that was at that 1919, uh, 1999 All-Star Game. It, it's, it's truly my favorite All-Star Game of all time. Even like the, the pre-game uh, you know, ceremony stuff with the home run hitting contest. All that stuff. The 1999 All-Star Game at Finley. By far, hands down, my favorite All-Star Game ever. Uh, and one of the things that was special about that All-Star was Ted Williams made like his emotional return to Fenway that night to throw out the first pitch. And my fondest memory of that All-Star weekend, which was, you know, just chock full of memories, was Tony Gwynn keeping Teddy Ballgame steady while he threw that first pitch. For me, it was a fitting way to start the last All-Star game of the 20th century. Now, as far as that 3,000 hit, only one player in baseball history had achieved their 3,000 hit and fewer bats than Tony Gwynn, and that is Wade Boggs. And only one player did in fewer games, and that's Roberto Clemente. Boggs and Gwynn, they both accomplished the feat in 2,440 games. As his career wound down, he played just 36 games in 2001 and 71 games the next season. 
He and fellow legend Calvert King Jr. would both be retiring at the end of the 2001 season, and they were both honored at the All-Star Game that year in Seattle. Both had played their entire careers for one team in their home state, and both would be inducted first ballot into the National Baseball Hall of Fame five years later. Uh, Tony was elected in on 97.6% of the vote, and at that time, he had the eighth highest voting percentage in Hall of Fame history. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is also my favorite uh, Hall of Fame class. Tony Gwynn, Calverkin Jr., two guys that played their whole career for, you know, basically their home city. I know Gwynn was born in, in L.A., but really, you know, he's a San Diego at heart. And, uh, you know, so uh, that, that is truly one of my favorite, favorite Hall of Fame inductions. Not only was Mr. Gwynn a badass on the diamond, he was a man totally invested in his community. In 1995, he was presented with the Branch Rookie Award, and that's given to the top community activists in all of uh, Major League Baseball. As well as, uh, he also won this inaugural Chairman's Award that is given to the San Diego Padre, who best exemplifies community spirit. And get this, he was also inducted in the World Sports Humanitarian Hall of Fame in Boise, Idaho in 1999. Now, look, I don't even, I didn't even know there was a World Sports Humanitarian Hall of Fame. And please, any of my listeners in Idaho, pardon my ignorance, if, if, if any of you in the audience from Idaho know about this, Please drop me a line on email, backwardskpod at gmail.com, and tell me more. I mean, I love athletic activism. These guys are on the biggest stage with some of the largest followings. I, I love it. And here's the thing. Even after all those batting titles and accolades, those three awards were bigger for Tony than any of that other baseball stuff. This is a guy who loved his community and was Always looking for ways to give back. And that's why shortly after retiring from Major League Baseball was announced on September 21st, 2001, that Tony Gwynn would officially be taking over all baseball operations for his alma mater in San Diego State when he accepted the offer to become their manager. In his second season at the helm, he was named Mountain West Conference Coach of the Year after leading the Aztecs to a 43-21 record and... Their first trip to the NCAA regional title, uh, regional round since 1991. In 2013, San Diego State would return to the NCAA regionals by Tony's hand. Gwynn's coaching record at San Diego State, it stands at 363 and 363. And he also was responsible for developing future major leaguers like Steven Strasburg and Justin Masterson. And Tony continued his devotion to community service for his city after retirement from baseball. With his wife, Alicia, he established the Tony Gwynn Foundation to help fund many organizations supporting children in need, like Casa de Amparo, Neighborhood House, YMCA, the Police Athletic League. For 14 years, he hosted the Tony Gwynn Celebrity Golf Classic to raise money for these foundations. And... As much as I personally admire Tony's exploits on the diamond, I'm even more fascinated by him as a man, as a human being, so selfless, so giving. And obviously, him and Alicia were very good parents. Tony Gwynn Jr. also played at uh, San Diego State, and then he made it to the majors. And their daughter, Anisha Nicole, was a recording artist. Not to mention, on a side note, that Tony's brother, Chris, Wound up going to San Diego State as well. He played Olympic baseball on the 1984 USA team. And he had a big league career as well. So, look, the Gwyns, that's just good all-American stock right there, baby. It was while coaching for the Aztecs that health problems began cropping up for Tony. At one point, he weighed more than three bills. He, he, he had a tumor in his neck. And it was removed for the third time in 2000. But... The biggest issue stemmed from his career, long use of chewing tobacco. He was eventually able to quit, but it was difficult, and by the time he did, it was too late. The addiction would take a toll on him, just as much as the side effects. 
And Tony, in 2011, he said, I screwed up. I, I made mistakes. I'm living with them now. I was pretty messed up, and I, I didn't even know it. I've been having two benign tumors removed. The third one was sadly cancerous. And Gwen was shocked by this, fully expecting it to come back benign like the others. When it didn't, my life kind of stopped that day. I, I wasn't sur surprised, but I was stunned. And Gwen underwent radiation and chemotherapy for months for salivary gland cancer. But after years of treatment, he succumbed to the disease on June 16th, 2014 at the age of 54. So, sidebar. Uh, all you youngins listening to my voice right now. If you're chewing that shit, knock it off. Spit that nasty shit out of your fucking mouth and never touch it again. You're going to wind up having operations on your necks and glands and it ain't worth it. You don't look cool. You look dumb. Knock it off. As far as you kids that ain't doing it, good job. Don't get on Snake's list. I'll bite you. Never try that chewing tobacco shit. Be a kid. Go get some big league chew and call it a fucking day. The future of this sport it depends on you. So don't fuck it up. Tony Gwynn was a wonderful, beautiful man. And the best way to honor him is to eliminate the thing that killed him. So, if you know someone who is struggling to quit chewing tobacco, please call 1-855-784-8836. That's 1-855-QUIT-VET. To speak to a counselor who can help you with a quit plan. Do it for yourself first and foremost. But also, do it for Tony. Today, a huge statue of the San Diego legend Tony Gwynn overlooks right field at Petco Park. In 2016, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game was played at Petco. And it was announced before the game that the National League batting crown would be named after Tony Gwynn forevermore. The entire hometown cr crowd erupts into chants of Tony, Tony. And of course, that moved many fans in the stands, including the Gwyn's uh, family, to tears. And folks, I think I'm going to, you know, end this story right here for the legendary San Diego sports icon. Thanks for uh, bearing with me here. My dog, look, I, I told you before, I, I don't edit, I don't dub. I just get on here and I do my thing on the mic. You know, my flower, she's here with me every show. And, uh, you know, sometimes things go like, I think it's kind of interesting, actually. But thanks for bearing with me with my dog. <laughs> I do find it imperative to tell you that. As I'm working on the show, the San Diego Padres are getting strip searched on the mound by Buck Showalter and the Mets. <laughs> it's crazy. Joe Musgrove, he's pitching naked now. You know, he, he just shutting New York down. He gave Buck the finger, and they've now moved on in the NL Division Series round to face those hated Dodgers. So, the Padres have moved on, and somewhere, somewhere, Tony Gwynn is smiling. How can you not be romantic about baseball? Hey, let's get even more horny. I'm going to give you his freaking stats here. Let's take a look at these uh, Tony Gwynn final MLB stats. 20-year Major League Baseball career, all with the San Diego Padres, 69.2 more. Seven Silver Slugger Awards, five Gold Glove Awards, 15-time NL All-Star, eight NL Batting Titles. That's tied with Hannes Wagner for the record. 1999 Roberto Clemente Award winner, Padres in National Baseball Hall of Fame, and his number 19 has been retired by the Fathers. He played in 2,440 games. He had 10,232 plate appearances, 1,383 runs, 3,141 hits, which is the 21st most in baseball history. 543 doubles, 85 triples, 135 home runs, 1,138 RBI, 319 stolen bases. He was caught stealing 125 times. Now, listen to this, folks. 790 walks, 
bullpen, 434 freaking strikeouts. Almost double the amount of walks to strikeouts. The most strikeouts he ever compiled in a season, 40 in 1988. In 135 games and 578 plate appearances. 40, folks. Boy, oh boy. Tony had a 338, 388, 459, slash 4,259 total bases and a 132 OPS plus. His 338 batting average is 22nd overall. And the very best career batting average after Ted Williams in the modern game. Almost every single player in front of him besides Teddy is from the segregation era of baseball. And even Teddy played a little bit of his career in the segregated era. And there you have it, folks. The one and only, the great Tony Gwynn. Rest in peace. Godspeed, and time will not dim the glory of your deeds. One of the greatest hitters who ever lived. If you want to learn more about Tony, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Like I said, uh, whenever I hear Tony talk hitting, I like to shut my lips and open my ears. Well, there's a great book. It's called The Art of Hitting by Tony Gwynn and Roger Vaughn. Pretty simple concept. It's actually what it sounds like. Uh, you know, it's Tony Gwynn talking about hitting. Tony Gwynn telling you how to hit. I mean, I saw it for $50 on Amazon. And there's also another book Tony wrote that I love and openly support. It's called Tony Gwynn, Total Baseball Player, Winning Techniques for Hitting, Fielding, and Base Running. And again... I'm kind of a Gwyn nerd. Whenever I heard him speak or whenever he had a book, I would always mark out and be like 100% engaged in uh, what the fuck he's talking about. I, I saw it for $30 at Etsy, and I highly recommend it for any of you youngsters learning the game right now. Also, don't forget, if you need, putting, uh, you need help putting down that smokeless tobacco, call 1-855-QUIT-VET and get yourself some help. Ask Tony. Well, if you could, it's never too late until it's fucking too late. Please, please stop chewing that garbage. There are also many great Gwen memories on YouTube and other platforms. So if you ever get a kick in the ass and you want to know more about Tony, there is plenty of stuff out there. So there you have it, folks. The great Tony Gwen is now part of our collection here at Backwards k Pod, And it's like I always say. I chop one head off the baseball hydra only to see two more baseball stories grow in their place. With Gwyn in the rear view mirror, I now turn my attention to the great one, the machine, Albert Pujols. With his Hall of Fame career over and his place in baseball history secured with over 700 home runs, your boy, Jake the Snake, will be the very first podcaster to collect his story. And I'm going to do that here at Backwards K-Pop, where we collect ball players and their stories. So, so looking forward to the Bull Hole Show. Parents, if you see your kid sitting on the couch, they got their nose in the phone looking bored AF. By all means, take him or her outside and play a game of catch. Thank you all for coming out. God bless and win the death.